Hello, all you fine bronies and pagan sisters. Welcome to the NBS show. I'm your host, the man, the myth, the hippogriff, Silver Quill, and I have faced the broom of doom. Joining me today in my journey through this insanity, we have planeswalker extraordinaire and podcaster Norman Sanzo. Hello, everyone. I'm the greatest podcaster that ever lived. There's nobody other than me. I have been the greatest one out of them all. Your logic is infallible. And also, we have our personal mascot and Pokemon pet map trainer extraordinaire, Safi Hartsong. Safi Hartsong? That's a new one. Okay. <laughs> yes, I feel, I feel like... Hi, I have oversized bird wings. Yes, and a shorter name, thanks to me. You're welcome. Just wait, I'll get you down to Saf. And then Safi Frass. And we are not... Safi Frass? <laughs> yeah. Safi Frass. I'm, yeah. I'm putting that on as my new nickname. Safi there we Frass go. Heart Song. <laughs> there we go. And th- now that I've said it, it must be true. And also we have a special guest for today's podcast. On a discussion of Mary Sue characters, we have someone who rooms with a Mary Sue. Please welcome Mad Munchkin. To answer your question, I don't know how to get rid of her. She's like a roach. She keeps coming back. Ah, excellence. Just <laughs> just like college. <laughs> well, lucky for me, oh, I, God, I, I graduated college. college seven years ago, so that's behind me. Yeah, Yay! but the roommate still stays with you. Yeah, it's unfortunate. <laughs> it's all right. She does the chores. I just sit and watch. Yeah, Mary Sue is an idealized, seemingly perfect fictional character. Oh, save it for the definition segment there. Heavens to Betsy. So, yes. Tell me what to do, you glorified pigeon. Oh. I've got a broom with your name on it. Ah, yes. My thing is, you all think I'm kidding. That's true. She's got it etched it in fire. She <laughs> she emblazoned it upon the hilt. <laughs> the one broom to swat them all and in the darkness dust them. <laughs> all right, then. Oh. Ah, uh, so yes, if if we haven't already clued in, then, well, that means you're not paying attention, in which case, oi! <laughs> we are talking about the concept of a Mary Sue character today, the bane of all fiction, the the critique that is lobbed left and right, and basically we're just like, what in the hoo-ha, hey, where did this come from? Why is it a thing? How can it be avoided? Normally, this is the part where we do first impressions, but you can't really first impress a Mary Sue because a Mary Sue does not impress. What are you trying to say? Nothing. That sounded mean, but I'm not sure why. (laughs) Please don't hit me. I feel like I should be offended. Please don't hit me with the one broom to dust them all. (laughs) Okay, I'll use this other one that I use to... I don't know what I use this one for. Uh... (laughs) To clean out the oh cobwebs. My goodness. To clean out the cobwebs. Oh, the terror! The, the terror! Better, Mr. Stupid. <laughs> oh, I should be offended, but I'm I... not. Oh, the power uh, of the Mary Sue's. <laughs> here, I can I can offend you more. Does that feather duster come with a French maid outfit? Ooh, <laughs> ooh la la! That's how it's a feather duster. You know how I made the feather duster? Ah ah ah! <laughs> Pro- probably with the plumage of my fallen brethren. <laughs> I was not involved in that. That's what... Sh- uh, sure you were. You snapped their necks. <laughs> no. Next snap, attack. Next snap, attack. Ah, <laughs> uh, but we, we go down fair, fond memory lane of, like, murder. Oh, no. Yeah, that says something about us. But, uh, Norman, I believe you were trying to say something before we got all crazy go nuts. Yeah, like, uh, either... You mentioned about first impression. Well, there's no first impression because there's nothing to be impressed about a Mary Sue. But how about we could be impressed because I can think of a few quote unquote Mary Sues that are really impressive. Well, let us start with definitions because perhaps it's how you regard the concept of a Mary Sue that determines how impressed you would be. Mm-hmm. So since we brought on an expert, Maddie, what is your take on the Mary Sue? Uh, the, Take on my Mary Sue, or just Mary Sue's in general? In general, as a in, criticism. In general, they're, like like what Mary said earlier, they're idealized and seemingly perfect fictional characters that are either really young or low-ranked, but somehow save the day through unrealistic abilities. I am totally not reading this off of the Wikipedia page. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> I'm not cheating. Shut up. It's not cheating. It's saving time. <laughs> but Amy, uh, with that <laughs> definition that you mentioned, like low rank and getting up in rank, 
that sounds to me like every shonen anime from Naruto to Bleach to even One Piece and even other stories, even Harry Potter. I think it's referred to as low rank because the term was actually coined by a Paula Smith. She wrote a Star Trek fan fiction thing that satirized oh. um, unrealistic characters. And the main character in that story was called Lieutenant Mary Sue. Okay. Like literally. So that's where the term came from. Oh, okay. Because she was just practically perfect in every way. And she was only 15, like the youngest <laughs> lieutenant ever. Yes. So wait, yes. She, she passed the Kobayashi Maru. Actually, she defeated the Kobayashi Maru. She did what no one else could have done and actually won the whole battle. Wait, I, I thought only um, Kurt. No, no, what was his name? I forgot his name. Um, Kurt. Yeah. Kurt, yeah, I thought Kurt. Kurt was the only one that solved the Kobayashi Maru. By hacking it. Yeah. But she, Ma- Mary Sue would have been the one who did it legit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, then. Too legit. Too <laughs> legit to quit. Hey, hey! Uh, that's hip hop there. I, I'm not even, I'm actually just making that up, but it is somewhat in line with what, with Maddie's yeah, definition. Yeah. <laughs> and Norman has apparently just seen something cute or inhaled a bunch of helium. No, the, the, the thing is with Mary Sue's is, I don't know, there's a fine line of what is it and what is that character? Because when you read something or when you see something on the TVs or usually Mary Sue is done in fan fiction. So usually when you read something and you go through the story of said hero, you're with the character. You, you are kind of struggling with said character, but sometimes there's a form of fiction that you read out and you feel like this is not right. It could be the writing, it could be the feeling of said character. And in my personal life, I only face one story and I don't remember it. And I didn't feel like, huh, this is a bit off. I don't like this story. And I stopped reading it. Probably that's a definition of a Mary Sue. But in general media, I see some of those if you're going by um what is written on the wiki. But I don't really know what a Mary Sue is, clearly from... The, what's the fault in our CUNY marks when you ask me what a Mary Sue is. Well, there's, there really is no full definition. I appreciate that Maddie look, brought in a, a defined quote from the most reliable website of information ever. <laughs> oh, you noticed that? Damn. <laughs> well, I'm just going to go to the page and edit it to say, what is a Mary Sue? Your face. <laughs> uh, Your boy. face is a Mary Sue. But, Mary uh, Sue is a face. <laughs> Let us continue forward. Safi. Yes. What's your new nickname again? Safi Waffy? Safafras. There you go. No, Safafras. no. Check check Twitter. Safafras. There we go. Safafras. And you're already oh, and you millennials are already tweeting about it. <laughs> <laughs> but what would you how would you define a Mary Sue? Oh boy, how I would define a Mary Sue. It's a bit complicated, but <laughs> A Mary Sue would be basically someone in my eyes who goes beyond what the normal standard would go by. Like, um, you know, say somebody becoming an alicorn, but that's not always the case. You know, in this fandom, the most common way to associate Mary Sues are those alicorn OCs with ungodly power that are related to the you know, certain characters like, oh, Celestia's daughter, I'm Luna's daughter, that's a Mary Sue to me. Like, something that's not possible being portrayed as possible in, like, not really, like, from a story perspective, like a fan fiction perspective, because, okay, yeah, in fan fiction you can do anything. Insert OC here, anyways. But... In real life, at least for me, if you're portraying an OC, it's not normal for me to, like, associate, like, you with, like, uh, being Luna's daughter. Like, if you're portraying your own Mary Sue character, yeah, you're a friggin' Mary Sue to me. And then to my own definition, I'm gonna turn things around a little. (laughs) I'm gonna say that, I'm gonna say that Mary Sue, a Mary Sue is not really a character. It is the audience's reaction. 
no matter the culture, we need to put a label on something in order to fully convey the idea. Uh, this has nothing to do with the fact that I just watched Arrival last week. Basically, Mary Sue is a term we use to convey our own displeasure at how a story is set up, or how it feels incomplete or too great a focus on one character at the expense of everyone. And therefore, there, because there's no definition of a Mary Sue, it's hard to avoid. People can scream your character is a Mary Sue, no matter how much effort you put into it. We'll get into this in a little bit, but one of my complaints uh, of the of fandoms in general is that people are too quick to jump on Mary Sue if a character does anything of merit. And so I say Mary Sue is really just the word we use to convey our own feelings and reactions, and that therefore it's very difficult, maybe even impossible, to label criteria to make your character a Mary Sue. Let's sort of break it down. Break, break it, it down. down. Break it down, yo. Because oh, there God. are... So- no, there are certain please things. no. <laughs> oh, we could... Yo, dog, that'd be play a yo. I don't care. <laughs> Shush. Yay, get the clues uh-huh. back. <laughs> no. Oh, don't be hating. I will hate all I want, old man. Oh, dude, that's just that. Does it look like I care? <laughs> Does it look like I'm white? It better. <laughs> Anyway, let's let's break this down into some elements because there are some common themes that people bring up regardless of your definition of a Mary Sue. Uh so first off, like Maddie said, is being related to someone of prominence within the show. It was Safi that said that, not me. All right. Well since Sa- since since Maddie too uh <laughs> said that <laughs> Daddy number two, but, but. That is a very sue there. <laughs> oh, great. Yes, Safi, you gotta change your screen name again. Now you're Maddie Sue. No, no. I've, I've already put out the tweet that my name is new, now Safi for SO. Yeah. No, no, no. You gotta update it, yo. Like to become no, uh, Maddie Sue. No, I, I refuse. No, I am Or, <laughs> or Maddie Sue. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yes. God. <laughs> Yeah, would that thing. just be changing the last few letters of Maddie's name or Mary's name? Uh, exactly. You're all you're already grasping some of the elements that make people scream Mary Sue. <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, so so since Safi Fras, Maddie Two, Maddie Sue brought up relationships, blood relationships. Why is it a bad thing if suddenly the characters have oh I don't know an inexplicable sibling that just appeared out of nowhere? Hi, Shining Armor. <laughs> Hi, Prince Blue Blood. Uh, Prince Blue Blood's legit, yo. It's Shining Armor. <laughs> Hi, Safia, Zephyr Breeze. Zephyr Breeze, there we go. Uh, Hi, Mod Pie. Uh... Yeah, here's the thing. All these characters have a similar theme. They just were there one day without any mention or true foreshadowing. However, I think we can agree the reception for Mod has and the reception for Zephyr Breeze has been very different than the initial reception for Shining Armor. So what's the difference? Well, in Shining Armor's case, he came out of left field. And once people kind of got into this whole story of how he was concepted, people got angry because this was not Lauren's original vision of the show. That was kind of the toy company being, oh, we need more money for toys, yo, so we need to have a pink alicorn pony so we can set it to the children. What sells? Weddings! Yes, let's create a wedding set. But now, who is going to marry said pink princess? Uh, we gotta think of something. Yes, people like the Twilight, so why not? But, opinions on shiny armor have improved over time. Yeah, true that. Why? Oh. Why? Why? That is the, the age-old question. And yes, even my opinion of Shining Armor has improved slightly. Just slightly. But because like he's had time to develop, I guess? I don't know. But that's a, that's a dangerous point to bring out because fic writers who write um, fanfics of Mary Sue's or their stories, they develop said character. What makes us like Shining Armor more than the character from My Immortal? I haven't read My Immortal, so I'm... I- 
really can't say on that score. Me neither. You trust me. Uh, but no. but isn't that the friggin' Evanescence song after Wake Me Up? Uh, yeah, like, oh god, no, please. If you guys want to know more about My Immortal, go search for my friend Lurker Cat. She's, she knows, she, she knows. Oh, that! Yes. Okay. All right. Yes. Yes. I know what you're talking about now. I haven't read it yet, but <laughs> Lurker's told me a lot about it, and she's yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. But yes. here's here's where the definition of Mary Sue starts to raise some eyebrows. I mean, the classic definition, what people always assume. Mm-hmm. Shiny armor. Okay. He seemed pretty hot to trot. Pun intended. Uh, when he came on, mm-hmm. Twilight oh saying he was, the, he was the bestest brother in the whole wide world. He could generate a shield that no one else could do. And honestly, I could go into why I didn't like him from the get go, but it had very little to do with that. But then Maud hits the scene and Maud is able to outwit the main cast. Everyone's trying to be her friend. She saves Pinkie Pie and hammers a rock into pebbles. And yet, from what I can tell, very few, if any, called her a Mary Sue. Similar fit situation with Gabby, who could help and do everyone and do everything and was celebrated the world over. Why, then, are they not ostracized as Mary Sues while other characters are? That is a good point, Silver, because yeah. the direct definition of a Mary Sue is Gabby. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hate to say it because Gabby's my favorite Griffin now. Uh, sorry, Gilda. But the way that she... I can do anything without any consequence. Yes. But the thing is, like, she's good at everything. That's the thing about, uh, Mary Sue. I can do everything. Everybody loves me. It's not just like where characters that you can define as Mary Sue's. It's not that they can do anything and everything. It's, um, that they find everything and anything easy and they they don't have any obstacles to overcome um they you know or if they do they overcome them too easily with no one else's help you know blah 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 i just saved the earth for the 167th time you know mm-hmm. <laughs> and no one will, will ever know because hashtag humility blah 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 <laughs> Um, Alicorn magic defies all laws of time and space, you know, the typical overpowered character that they're just so, um, perfect in every single possible way. They're unrelatable. <clears throat> and when you're talking about characters like Shining Armor or mods and people throw the term Mary Sue at them, I'm like, well, no, they are a character that's been kind of boomed in and maybe their execution and introduction was a little bit because eh, there was no foreshadowing for them. But, yeah, I, th- I just think the term Mary Sue is thrown around a lot, and not just in this fandom. Like but That's because the meaning of it has changed so much as well. Another but- character now that I think about it um, that I relate to a Mary Sue, mm-hmm. has anyone seen, like, anything of the recent Fairly Odd Parents? Uh, no, not really. Not in the recent. Um I've seen a review of an episode by Mysterious Mr. Renter, so I think I know what character you're yeah. talking about. I think her name is Chloe oh, that they introduced. Isn't that the new girl that has to share the fairies with Timmy? Yep. Oh. Please pretty tell how is this character like, because i seen pictures, but I haven't seen the episode. I've actually seen the episode, actually, like for myself before the Mysterious Mr. Renter character. I remember hating this character. The first thing she does, like, in that logic of that world, only children who are miserable can get, like, fairy godparents. And apparently there's a shortage or whatever. Her main reason for being quote-unquote miserable is because she makes mistakes. Okay, um, it seems good enough. And, Carry well, on. She yes, made a mistake, very, very. apparently, when she tries to help people, it makes everything worse. Well, it doesn't seem that and, bad. And she's, and she's apparently beloved by everybody, including the president. <clears throat> okay. Yes, yeah, so you just have to ask yourself, why is this person miserable enough to, um, need to have? She's, she's yeah. rich and just, <clears throat> Yeah, okay. Um, in all honesty, if you didn't say the part where the president loves her, because, okay, helping is 
a good trait to have. Making mistakes while helping, okay, that could cause some problems, but you know what? Yeah, but she's, like, beloved by everybody as soon as she's on screen. <laughs> okay, that, that is a problem there, yeah. Silver? I want to seize on what uh, Maddie Sue just said about... Yeah, let that sink in. <laughs> What you say about beloved by everyone, because <laughs> going back to the idea of being related to a, a show canon character, mm -hmm. isn't that in a way a shortcut to being beloved, being celebrated? Everyone has a reason to immediately take an interest in you because you are related to them. Well, uh, that is a double-edged sword because automatically being related to one of the main stars is yes it's a shortcut and people would love to see for example here um hinata and naruto hook up and get kids and one called burrito and one calls something i don't remember but <coughs> people like those i don't rem wow those are some cruel parents to name a kid that <laughs> yeah but still um some people want to ship characters once character ships they have to get jiggy with it and get kids hence you get OCs, where OC needs to have their own adventure. So, writers create up stories where, oh, um, Naruto get jiggy with it and get a kid, and said son is called Burrito, and he hates his dad because his dad doesn't, is neglecting and whatnot. So, it's kind of the shortcut there, and from me saying this, this is official by the way. <laughs> uh, he named his son Burrito? Oh, my goodness. Must have been hungry that day. Yeah, I, I may be embellishing a few words here and there, but still. Yeah. No, I, I'm, I am aware of this series. <laughs> but here's the flip side. Oftentimes when people throw the term Mary Sue out, I like to say that a character can have no family relation, that almost seems cruel. It's like, I want to condemn this character to a lifetime of loneliness with no familial relations. <laughs> you can't touch her. Technically... Do people do do that? I mean, the the term here is like okay. You, you want to relate with X character. You, you want this. Um, you want your OC to be related to X character. Sure, but what's the reasoning? How is the story? Like you have to have a good darn backstory to make it work. Because I could say that uh, my OC is related to. Um, the royals of Cantalot, which is um, Celestia and Luna, but he lives a normal life in Ponyville doing some kind of radio show that nobody listens to. <laughs> it, like, I could say that, but in all honesty, nah, I, I don't want to have that backstory because it raises up more questions. More questions than answers? Yes. <laughs> uh, Maddie, what do you think about if a, is a character re being related to a show canon character is that an automatic Mary Sue? To a lot of people, it is. Um, to me, it it needs to make sense. If you're going to put, like, well, uh, self-insertion of an OC into a, the, the show, it has to make sense with the canon. If, if it's going to be canon with the show, it needs to make sense. So you can't, like, just randomly give Celestia a daughter without explaining where she she came from or a son you know whatever you need to explain this you know so many people are like yes this is who they are this is this is the the son of celestia or the daughter of celestia or luna or whatever but they don't like so often the they don't give um how that came about mm. they just go into the relationship between um said parent and said character and why they're the way they are and blah 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 and I'm like yes but 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 how who is the who is the father you know like can you s explain this and they're like oh we don't know you know it was a, a dark thing that can't be explained Celestia doesn't want to talk about it kind of thing I'm like oh come on that's just lazy writing man to, to me it doesn't died. It, like, <laughs> the father died oh, <laughs> you know, yeah um yeah. Your mother yeah, but, cried and your father yeah. died. <laughs> and then there's the whole thing where it's a fan fiction, therefore it could be a head canon as well. So then you you don't have to stick with the rules of the show. You can mm. make up your own rules. But so then then you've got the problem of um sticking to the logic you've created for the story. So it's it's making more work for yourself. And any character can be a Mary Sue regardless of species or gender. Like, cause the term Mary Sue refers to both 
male or female. Although some people use the Gary Stu or Marty Stu instead, but yeah, it's um. I I like to point something out. Um, it's it has something to do with the pony universe where okay, someone is related to Celestia. Well, in my head canon, or in my ideal story here would be, how is this one uh, OC related to Celestia? A safe bet would be it is um, Celestia is his or her grandmother or great great grandmother because come on, you live for a thousand years, you gotta have kids somehow. That who says you gotta? I mean, what if she chooses not to? Oh. But there was one thing. Um, I can't remember if it's explained in the show. Maybe it's explained in the comics. But where did Prince Blue Blood come from? If he's the nephew of Celestia and Luna, there's another sibling around. So. You know, I want to know where he came from. Is that explained in the comics at all? In in all honesty, there's no written record of how did Prince Bluebird became royal of um, Celestia and Luna. Most of the fanfic writers would say that it was adopted via house or something. I mean, this is all hit canon. I'm saying about Bluebird here. There's no official thing that well, there is. There was a statement by Lauren Faust, mm-hmm. however, mm-hmm. that should always be taken with a grain of salt. Mm-hmm. Uh, from what I heard, Blue Blood is a, is a blood relative, but descended, uh, from a previous, uh, offshoot of the family line. Really, they just needed someone to ship for, to tempt rarity during the best night ever. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the, the hard truth. And this yeah. goes back to what I mentioned before about being related to Celestia in terms of um, genes. Like, you're not directly related, but it's kind of a, a genetics via, oh, you're my great, 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 great grandmother. I was your father's uncle's cousin's son's second roommate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that. But, what does that make us? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> yes. But that, now that you mentioned relationships, what about the Mary Sue of oh, all the main characters love me and I am the very popular one and even the guy likes me too? What? That's that's fiction? That's me every day. <laughs> <laughs> but it's always shipped with the dudes. <laughs> all right, baby. Uh, but still. Hey, pony. But still. Well, yes, let's move on. Let's move on to the romantic aspect. Romance. Mm-hmm. For if a Mary Sue is not related by blood, pretty soon they might be related by marriage. Mm-hmm. Marriage. <laughs> marriage is what brings <laughs> us together. I, 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 Inconceivable! I, I, uh, in all honesty, I've heard a lot of description of set OCs where Set OC is a black and red alicorn with seven wings and he is the daughter to, or he is the son to Celestia and Luna and all the main six love him and all of them are girlfriends and whatnot. I mean, I've heard those kind of descriptions before and cringe all over the place, but still, they exist. They exist. It's a thing. Well, now, as we get further into this, I'm going to be referencing my own character, uh, clutter step. Clutter who, uh, step. <laughs> yes, because yes, I did have him show a romantic interest in Twilight. Mm-hmm. He was uh, adorable. Oh my gosh. Okay, see, so there, there's at least one person who likes my character. I like Clutter Step too. Thank you. But, Seriously, mm-hmm. Clutter Step. Oh my gosh, I want to hug him. Ah! But here's the thing: Clutter <laughs> could be considered a Mary Sue too because of how he came around. And that's but the, the difference is that. Clark's step is actually likable. That's the well, that's there's a difference. Has his own backstory that well, is actually could be believable in my eyes. Well, there's the thing. It's it's a this is why I sort of hesitate when we try to give a textbook definition, mm-hmm. saying if your character reaches reaches this criteria, they are instantly a Mary Sue. And that's not a dig against you, Maddie, for mm-hmm. uh, reading that definition because it's a very good starting point. But I'd like to I'd like to think there are exceptions to these because based on the effort put in. Yeah, but it's not necessarily like like um like you know the like your your I'm sorry I've forgotten your character's name. Oh, cl- um, clutter clutter step. Thank, thank you, clutter step. Um, 
that's your author's insert, quote unquote. So you've developed the character personality. It makes sense within the 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 story setting as well. It's it's not just a wish fulfillment for you, you know. So yeah, I think for me, like Mary Sue, is more for um, characters that are very underdeveloped, and their only character trait is they are married to this person or they are the son of that person, you know, and that's it. And, yeah, I'm like, hmm, hmm, yeah, kind of needs a little bit more development there. But, yeah. (laughs) I I think that's the key word to pushing your character away from the Mary Sue status, which is development. Because we mentioned Zephyr Breeze. We mentioned Gabby or Gabriella Griffin. We mentioned... Uh, who else did we mention? Um, Technically, Shining Armor and Cadence, but let's Shining expand Armor. beyond. Yeah, and also yeah. Uh, Mod and the Pie family, or well, Mod to be exact, more. But still, we they have proper development. They had good developments, especially for Shining Armor in the comics. The comics really push his development to make him more likable. And for Mod, when I first saw her, she was never the Mary Sue. She was stoic, no. too stoic. But that's her character trait. And Zephyr... She's like, I am a monotonal geologist. <laughs> yeah. And Zephyr was... Mm. <sighs> we hate him because reasons. But he was designed... Well, I like be... him a little bit. Yeah. He was designed... <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> he was designed to be hated. But that's hated. mostly because he's a spoiled brat. Yeah, but he was designed to be hated. So could you really dislike him? Like, he's designed to be hated. So they did a good job on that. And so on. Well, here's the thing. I did some reading up on Mary Sue characters and just the topic of it. And one thing people pointed out is, is your character so quirky or trying so hard to be uh, vulnerable so the audience will like them? And that, again, I have a, I created an OC who is very accident prone. Okay, yeah, true that. And so I was like, mm. but the, the one person posted a very curious description of that. Uh, she said, she wrote, let's, let's say there's a young girl in high school and she's very clumsy. She falls down a lot. But that clumsiness becomes a, a blessing when she falls down, drops her book, and a cute boy picks it up for her, gives it to her, says she, she's really attractive, and boom, instant romance. <laughs> she actually said, she actually stated that a lot of modern day published young adult fiction relies on stuff like this. Isn't it Sailor Moon? That's one example, but apparently it's happening in a lot of teen stories. Mm. I'm not really surprised Sailor Moon is uh, indicative of that. The fun name Sailor Moon. <laughs> but and yet, no one really calls Sailor Moon. I don't think anyone's called Sailor Moon a uh, Mary Sue, even though she grows up to be queen of the world. Everyone drops everything to save her, help her. Well, there's a certain backstory at the very beginning. I I maybe. Uh, forgetting stuff because it's been so many years since I read the manga. But uh, there's a certain development at the very beginning where they mentioned that, oh, this is the reincarnation of the queen, something like that. that. That's how I remember it. Like, it's been so long since I last read it. But the, again, it's it, I just trying to stress the idea that the hard and fast rules that people are looking for may not exist. Probably. With this day and age of how stories are being written, sometimes you get overpowered characters who people enjoy. A good example is Saitama from One Punch Man. He is uh, too st- He is stupidly strong and nobody can defeat him. That is th- that by definition is a Mary Sue. But Gary Sue. Gary Sue, the male yeah, equivalent. Gary Sue. But still we but we all like him. He's very lovable. And one of the facts is that the author one Mentioned that to have a super powerful character is easy, but to make him relatable and enjoyable to the readers without hating him is hard. How do you do that? And Very carefully. Yes, and he did it. <laughs> he did it. And he is one very popular anime character of 2015. I'll add to that. Uh, Kamina from Gurren Lagann. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Now think think about him meeting the criteria for Gary Stu. In, intensely popular, handsome, even even though he's very lecherous, he's the girls seem to find that charming for some reason. Mm-hmm. 
he can basically shout and bully his way through a situation with no consequence. And even if people don't agree with him, they offer a begrudging respect to him. Well, there's spoiler warnings for the Mary Sue sacrifice. And yet he is pretty fondly regarded. I think Not because... to mention the fact that he got to kiss Yoko Littner before he died. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's your spoilers. Whoops, was that spoilers? Oh. I didn't mean it. Oh, God, no. But still, um, that there is the definition of, well, quote-unquote, a Mario Gary stew. Because they're so OP that they're loved by everyone. But in this case, where with Kamina and Saitama, we like them. We, we don't view them as such. But there's another archetype where once my friend described him to me, I said that, are you for reals? Like, is this his character arc? Are you sure? And that is Ichigo from Bleach. If you guys know Bleach, it's a story of said guy who stumbles upon something and he becomes deaf. Or in this case, a Shinigami. A god of death. Yes. A keeper of the soul society. Mm-hmm. Masters of filibusting for entire volumes. I actually have a bunch of Bleach volumes in my uh, collection. Animu <laughs> corner. Yeah. Spoilers uh, ahead I'll... for people who have not read it and are interested in reading it. But here's the thing. Ichigo here is a Shinigami, has the power of a hollow, and has the power of a Quincy. Technically, he has all three of the main powerful characters in the show. Qu- Quincy's are, quote-unquote, an upper echelon of character or s- char- society. I don't remember. Hollows or the lower class where they're just... They're demons. Yeah, demons. Is is it bad that I used to be a really big fan of Bleach no, back when no, he, it was a thing? Here's the thing. No, <laughs> no it's that. not bad because if you like it, you like it. But if you grown up and dislike it, it's your, what you call this? It's your... Prerogative? Yes, that's the thing. For me, I tried to follow Bleach. I watched the anime, but fillers were about and it turned me off. Yeah, the filler for Bleach was definitely not the most pleasing part of it for me. <laughs> Would you say it was very unfulfilling? <laughs> yeah. I, I was so mad when Toonami had cancelled Bleach in the middle of a uh, certain arc, like that was supposed to be like the very end of Bleach. Oh god, I was so pissed. Anyways, <laughs> back to Mary Sue's. Uh, yeah, like I mentioned here, Ichigo to me is a Mary Sue because he has the power of everyone. That is just too OP. I also like, wait, when did he become a Quincy? Oh, his mother was a Quincy. Oh, his mother was, yeah, mother was a Quincy, father a Shinigami. Mm-hmm. Your um. mother was a hamster, and your father smelled of elderberries. <laughs> I fought in your general direction. <laughs> oh my goodness, you people. <laughs> but you still... cannot, you cannot stop us. We will quote Monty Python at you. <laughs> mm-hmm. yes. But still. <sighs> Monty, what now? Oh my god, are you for reals? No, she's <laughs> not being for reals. Don't, don't <laughs> give in to her trolling, Norman. But we, I'm on to you, Missy. Oh, Miss Seth, Miss Sethy Frass, Mar- uh, Maddie Sue, <clears throat> the third, Esquire. Wait, wait, who's the second then? Mary Sue. <laughs> yeah, but her name isn't Maddie Sue. Back me up on this, Maddie. She's gonna have it legally changed, yeah? <laughs> I don't know what to say at this point. <laughs> I know, we're, we're cre- much like a Mary Sue character, we're just making things up as we go along. <laughs> if in fact, maybe that's part of it. We, People can that's, sense a, pure, a yeah. purely reactionary attitude in writing the character. That that's actually um, one of the the good things about um, having a, a a Mary Sue character. They can actually be a lot of fun if you've done it deliberately as like a parody or a satire of a perfect character, which is what Mary Sue is. Um, but the funny thing is, like, um, with, with my Mary Sue, she was meant to be just a one-off joke character. She was never meant to come back. But people liked her so much because she was so annoying. Or rather, because Maddie found her so annoying, you know, they found that funny because Maddie was being tortured and, you know, it's, 
people seem to find that entertaining for some reason. I can't think why. Well, your um, your pain is their pleasure. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Take, yeah. take it from um, someone who it, knows. <laughs> yes, it's really it's really fun to write as well, and um, because Maddie is is she's a full time cynic, um, but she's also quite a passionate character as well. But um, yeah, she really needed someone to bounce off of and. Mary Sue provides a flaw for her and, you know, some, just give her something else to do other than be analytical and, uh, just read off a script kind of, I don't like this and here is why. And then, <laughs> but Amy, that's, uh, written Mary Sue. You program her that way so she would react to Mad Munchkin, your character. So to me, Mary Sue is deliberately built that way just to annoy Matt Munchkin. Uh, by the way, I love that you say she's programmed that way. I have this Mary bot <laughs> in my head now. <laughs> uh, version what? Well, you know, she can do she can do anything and everything, so that must include turning herself into a robot. <laughs> so, <laughs> Mary bot, com- commence room cleaning status. Beep boop. Oh. Update needed. Oh. <laughs> I just had a sudden thought. I'm like, it's okay if we if she's installed Windows Vista, we're safe. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, don't die! No, no. no. Oh. You mentioned okay. Windows. Yeah. You enter Windows Vista, and he goes into a conniption. <laughs> oh god! I well, but if she's like some kind of cyborg, we're all doomed to be like the Borg from Star Trek. <laughs> Ooh. Better yet, yeah, a ma- uh, Lord, you want to totally be assimilated? <laughs> oh God, the, the man is futile. Also, we've got cookies. <laughs> what? <laughs> Truly, they are fast that cannot be stopped. Wait, yeah. wait, Maddie, are you on the dark side? Maddie's I'll on meet the- you over there. Of course, I'm on the dark side. It's more oh, fun over here. Who wouldn't you know, have her cookies over there? On <laughs> what about that shadowy place? Oh, that's that's head cannon territory. <laughs> 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 oh, so um, that's where Ink Rose has been. <laughs> um, but but, yeah, they... so so let's let's see a little bit on this gray area that we've been touched on because we for every absolute we try to lay down with Mary Gears Two's, there are very real exceptions. And one of the strongest that you mentioned is Kamina and Saitama. They, they are the prototypical Mary or Gary Sue. I'm going to add one to that. Oh. Uh, R- River Song of Doctor Who. I'm trying to remember okay. her story plot, but I'm not 100% I can okay, agree. I'm, ga- I'm, Safi, I'm sorry, I'm ga- Silver. I tried getting into Doctor Who. It didn't work for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm not, I'm not holding that against you or anything. That, believe this me, time? This time. This time. This time it is at least somewhat believable. But you've never seen Indiana Jones. Okay. Oh, she. All right. Now I remember. Yeah. Uh, okay. Just just to summarize for those who might not be Whovians, it would I'm be- not a Whovian. Summarize for me, pigeon. It might it might behoove me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Doctor Who, time traveling alien from an from who goes on adventures in a throughout time in a police box, an old phone booth from England, that's really a disguised time machine. Well. At one point, and I'm I'm telling this chronologically, whereas the show unfolded this in pieces. Chronologically, one of his companions, two of them, Amy and Rory, got married and had a kid. The kid was abducted and raised apart from them as they were searching for, for the child throughout time. That child grew up to be River Song, who has many elements of a, of the Doctor's people, the Time Lords, but is part is part human as well. She can do things that previously only the doctor could do, regenerate her appearance, pilot the space machine, the TARDIS. Uh, the doctor's main el- enemy, the Daleks, are even reduced to begging when uh, confronted by her because she's just that powerful. A lot of fans screamed Mary Doctor could not do. And yes, by series end, or not, not even series end, it's still going. By the end of her arc, however, she was married to the Doctor. Okay. So all this stuff going on, people <laughs> people were very split. Some thought she was the greatest character ever. They loved her. Uh, they loved her attitude, her recklessness, her uh, ability to muck everything up, and her ability to keep the Doctor guessing. Others, including internet reviewer Phalus, okay. 
just simply <laughs> said, God, you stupid Mary Sue. <laughs> There's another question. When does, how far does that go? It sounds, when I summarize it, it really does sound like a Mary St- Sue, uh, complex that we've heard in fan fiction. Mm. And you know what? I think it's perspective because when I mention Ichigo, like I'm sure there's a whole story arc that uh, wraps everything in a neat and tidy bow where if you read it from start to <laughs> end, you'll kind of agree with what the writers have done. And with River Song, her first appearance, she died. Her first appearance yes. in the show, she died. <laughs> It's kind. Of, it's kind of the t- time traveler's wife. She is. Oh. She and the, she and the doctor are moving backwards mm, from one another. Yeah, it, she meet. He meets her at her end. She's known him all her mm-hmm. life, and it goes backwards from there. And that was with Tenant, right? The Ten Doctor. Yes, it started with Tenant, ended with Capaldi. Yeah. And wait, didn't Tenant have a thing for uh, what was it? The Queen of England at one point. Uh, yeah. Yes, that. That was also a yeah, thing. Yeah. But that's the Doctor. <laughs> Craziness mm-hmm. abounds. It's Doctor Who. Mm-hmm. But yeah. Um, I prefer <clears throat> Matt Smith. He was cute. Well, Matt Smith came after Tenant. But still, I think it's true. It's the what you might call this perspective. If things are put into perspective, you can agree or disagree. Like you mentioned Phalus, he disagrees and calls Song a Mary Sue, which, you know, unfortunately, for him he doesn't like it i personally do enjoy river song you have a song in your heart (laughs) it's like a river flowing oh so it's not a watered down experience (laughs) oh no i (laughs) ain't i i i just realized oh god my god no silver quill will do thank you (laughs) just uh, Uh. you bet me to it i was gonna say that (laughs) Okay, but, Seppi, what did you realize? No, I I just realized something, like, after Song of Your Heart, like, oh. no, I have a boyfriend. Go away, Norman. <laughs> what? I need a... Uh, okay, anyway, <laughs> Silver, what is it? Well, we've, we've embarrassed. But, yeah, you know, we've been talking about Mary Sue's in the context of mm-hmm. fan fiction, but much like with Phalus and River Song, uh, there's the accusation of actual characters in popular culture yes. being Mary Sue's. <laughs> Twilight, Twilight is accused of this very often. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, he's no longer part of the fandom officially, but Tommy Oliver did a big, did a big video on this. Mm-hmm. I think I remember it. Yeah. And I will admit there are times in more recent seasons where it feels like the world is being put down <clears throat> to elevate Twilight further. Case in point, uh, the Cutie Remark. I believe it's Cutie Remark. Yeah, the season four mm-hmm. finale. Sorry, season five. Mm. Yeah, I was going to say. I made the comment that when Starlight denounces Twilight for her overinflated ego, and I like, you know, that, that's kind of true. You've basically got a whole episode saying that without my, without these characters, no one else in this world is capable of doing anything at all. And I thought, you know what, that that, that is. I can, I don't agree that Twilight is a Mary Sue, but I can see why people start to resent over prominence. That, uh, basically this world cannot function properly without her because she's, she's so gosh darn important. Oh, you're talking about that Twilight. I was thinking about the other Twilight. What? Oh, well, we, <laughs> what we could all Twilight do. What Twilight are you thinking of? We could do without Stephanie Meyer anytime. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so now that I've offended all the Twilight fans in the audience, <laughs> but <in> both <laughs> sets, all three of them. <laughs> oh, we're talking, we're talking both sets, both Pony Twilight and Book Twilight, or oh, as okay. I like to call it, I'll, Team Shirtless. I'll, I'll change it then. It's all nope, still only three. All right. <laughs> <laughs> but one, can a official character be considered a Mary or Gary Sue? To a point, like, but. The thing is, with Twilight, we have traveled throughout the series. We have seen her struggles. So, whatever we see now is what she deserves. Okay, let's just say this. If you're new to the show, and suddenly you've seen the battle with Twilight and Tyrek, what will your first impression be? Dragon, dragon, rock the dragon, dragon. <laughs> oh, see. Ah! 
Yeah, but besides that, like, oh, why is this pony so powerful? Why is she doing the Kamehameha wave? Like, she, mm-hmm. why is she, ugh, Mary Sue? But, like I mentioned before, perspective. Yeah, I can see why some people consider Twilight uh, a, a Mary Sue because she's one that usually has the answers to fix everything or it's like, oh, I need to find this one book that has the answer to solve this this problem or, you know, but then Pinkie Pie comes in and be like, I found it right away. It was under E! <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, yeah, um, but in that episode when she's fighting, fighting, sorry, Annunciate Woman, when she's fighting Tyrick, and she's she's got all this powers. It's like she's um she's the 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 Superman of MLP now, and Superman himself is basically the Messiah. Like, <laughs> oh no, you know, yes, I am Jesus the Messiah. I will die for your sins, kind of thing. You know, like <laughs> yeah. And then I'll come back in a Justice League sequel. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Does this yeah, maybe mean that maybe. Jesus is secretly, um, what is it, uh, a Mary Sue? <laughs> <laughs> there, okay, let's get really heretical here. <laughs> How many people can we offend in one podcast? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> um, no, um, you could always go the other way, like when characters are so overpowered, they're automatically Mary Sue's, but you could go the other way, you could go like, go characters that go through hardships without complaining or anything, they're considered Mary Sue's as well. Um, example, Cinderella, or, um, Little Goody Two Shoes, which is just basically another Cinderella story, you know, these girls that are put through such horrible hardships and, forced to serve people that really don't deserve it, you know, but because they're um so perfect, they're just gonna suffer in silence because they're waiting for their day where they will their prince will come and save them, you know. So characters who self deprecate feel sorry for me, but it's okay. It's just my lot in life kind of thing. I'm not gonna complain. Blah blah blah. Aren't usually stories from fairy tales, usually from the Brothers Grimm uh well grim like they they have really dark stories like if you read the original stories of sleeping beauty it's like yeah there's certain things i can say on the show but yeah yeah i i'm always a fan of both the original cinderella where the Wicked stepsisters and mother have their eyes gouged out oh and not to mention that the one sister had to cut off her friggin foot to and fit then, into the slipper. Yeah, yeah. 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 And then, uh, Sleeping, was it Sleeping Beauty or? Yeah, 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 were, yeah. Sleeping they, Beauty, are you referring to the part where, uh, no, the prince no, has no. to impregnate her in uh, order to wake her up? Is that what he had to do? Oh, yep. God, no. I must be thinking of another one. What's the one where they make the witch dance until she dies? Oh, uh, I don't know. Uh, wasn't that Snow White? <laughs> might, might have been. I'm not sure. I can, um, but still, like, yeah. usually when you take the context of, um, fairy tales from the Bird is Grim, original stories were not that pleasant, so I don't mind having a Mary Sue. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. I, I mean, basically, I think what we're, what's coming through in this discussion is, one, we're all insane. <laughs> True. Two. Speak two, for yourself. Gosh. Two. Really, there's always an exception, but it's really more how the audience reacts, but also how much we really empathize with a character's struggles, which raises another question. Some people argue that a Mary Sue character does not have to be perfect. Sometimes they're so flawed that you think, oh, you're trying way too hard to gain our sympathy. Yeah. And Uh that leads... That, that sort of sets the stage for tragic backstory. Yes, uh, I have a perfect example. Oh, please. Um, Toru from Fruits Basket. <laughs> okay. Perfect example. Um, are you guys familiar with that anime? I've heard of the anime before. I've heard of it. I've never seen it. Something it's... about, like, one of the characters is able to turn into a cat if you boop him or something? <laughs> or if you hug him? <laughs> what is um, it? Well, basically, it's uh, about the, um, well, 
people listening will probably correct me here, but the the anime is basically about a family who are under a curse where um they when a member of the opposite sex hugs them, they turn into their animal from the zodiac. So for instance, one of the characters is a rat, so if he gets hugged by a girl, he turns into a rat. And then there's another character who's a dog and blah, and blah, blah, blah. And then, yeah. Um, Toru, who um, discovers this family's curse, um, she has been living in a tent um, on her own um, for a couple of weeks. Um, her mother died a year before the anime is set, um, which is why she's living in a tent. And um, but she's one of those person that it's like, oh, look at that beautiful sky. What a glory, glorious day and just so happy. But then all this horrible, tragic stuff happened in the past. And you're like, yes, you need to feel sorry for this character because she's so happy all the time. But oh, my God, look at the horrible stuff that's happening to her, you know, trying too hard to get us to sympathize with her and feel sorry for her. Blah, blah, blah. And I was just, oh, yeah. Can be a pretty Mary Sue kind of character, but but the story of the story that that frames the character is just so interesting. I can kind of forgive it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, with that definition of well, what you gave, wouldn't that be the same with um, Harry Potter? Yeah, that comes under the kind of the Messiah kind of thing, you know, the chosen one. <laughs> The chosen one who's not all that chosen when he starts. Yeah. Although in some ways that too is wish fulfillment for the audience. Mm. Kids who uh, want, who start off humbly and want to believe they'll make it big right away. Yeah. Or that they're chosen because they're special. Mm-hmm. Mm. And that's... Everyone's special. <laughs> Nobody's special. Everyone's special. No one will be. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Ah, love the Incredibles. Well, here's the question. If a character has a dark history, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll do you way, 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 way better for, for sheer grim. Mm-hmm. Guts from Berserk. Oh. I haven't seen that. I, I'm not familiar with that. Okay. <laughs> Have he gotten off the boat yet? <laughs> That's Alucard. No, no, no. A few people will understand it. <laughs> okay. Well, oh boy. How do I, how do I describe this? I apologize to young listeners. Guts was born in the midst of war. His mother was hung, but even though she died, she was still carrying him, and he was still born. Okay. So he's raised by a company of mercenaries, goes out on his own, finally makes friends, but friends betray him, betrays him, becomes a demon, and does horrible things to Guts' girlfriend. Guts loses an arm in the process, and is basically on a quest of revenge. Believe me, if I, I could go into finer detail, but you really don't want to hear it. I don't think I want to mm. either. Fans love this guy. They love him dearly because that's just one of the most hardcore stories you're ever going to hear. At the same time, I think, well, hang on, isn't that isn't that a bit Gary Stu in that you said my character has the worst life ever? <laughs> It's the perfect way to get people hooked into the character because they're like, they're tr- troubled, but I can save them. You know? But in, <laughs> I, like this, I, I, I think I'm becoming a record player because mm. perspective, so perspective, that's <laughs> what makes, uh, thing work. Because, okay, if you want to go tragically, I can say Dante from Devil May Cry. His dad was the demon. His mother was a human. Uh, they bone and then they have twins, one called Dante, one called Virgil. Uh, Virgil was sent off to someplace else to live the demon life, while Dante here uh, lived on his own. He suffered, he had a bad upbringing, he saw dead people and demons and whatnot, and grew up to become a demon slayer. Although he was also just funny as can be. Uh, yeah, personality was awesome. <laughs> he was so cocky. Again, that's. I think that might be what saves a character from having an a backstory that seems to Gary Stu pity me or Mary Sue pity me, how they respond. Cause Dante is a true jokester. I love watching clips of him tease the, the enemies he's about to fight like the overly dramatic demon. Ha ha. Thinking you can defeat me is the, is the height of delusion. 
And that's guts. And that's uh, that's Dante talking. <laughs> now guts, uh, despite his upbringing, he's not the least bit merry, but there's sort of that grim determination to him that seems more sincere. He's not just, oh, I've had such a bad day. Oh, I'm Sasuke. Because <laughs> admit it, Sasuke, oh, woe is me. My brother killed my clan. Nobody likes me. I don't care for anything. Curse I'm you. a total edgelord. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's not a phase, Mom. So true. <laughs> Curse you, Kishimoto. How do you say his name? Kishimoto Mayamoto. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, Something. but okay. Something if you want to add up. Naruto to the list, Naruto himself, Uzumaki Naruto, been orphaned his whole life. Mom and dad perish in some kind of accident, and everybody hates him. Well, he's rejected, but he's also he's also loud, outspoken, kind of a class clown. He's a little not, bit obnoxious. Mm-hmm. A little bit obnoxious, but also sincere. I thought the the first chapter did a really good job of making him seem more human, certainly more than Sasuke. Uh, later, later, as we went further in the series and he started getting more the Messiah chosen one, the, that empathy started to go away. But still, um, during the previous arc, I didn't see him as the quote-unquote Messiah. I, I thought that he was doing his best to kind of stop all this nonsense because, well, you want what you want is... Not good for the community, so stop it. Knock it off already. Well, now I can, all I can think of now is, uh, is, uh, what, what is Little Karibo's a Brit fan base parody of a fan base parody? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Naruto. <laughs> Sasuke eating rice. Om nom 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 <laughs> nom nom nom. Cast <laughs> you rice. I'll be hungry in half an hour. Bakora! <laughs> <laughs> uh, but before we go too much further though I'd like to bring up two debated topics mm. within this fandom uh, first w- first, going back to Tommy Oliver he used Superman as an example of uh, a Gary Stu-esque character mm-hmm. and, I mean Superman has become a character who could f- who could do anything he's oh. got a superpower for every problem <laughs> Yeah, but Tommy's argument was Superman is not a Gary Stu because he has Lex Luthor there to stand as an opposition to his ideals. Really? Lex? Lex, who may not have all the superpowers, but he's got his intelligence and selfishness counters Superman's physical strength and generosity. I'm not really sure I buy into that argument because you can have a Gary Stu villain as well. True that. Oh. You can have a... Hmm? Sorry? Yeah, a- Amy's got a revelation, <laughs> like... Ooh, what 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 has what has lit in your mind? No, I just can't believe that um you know, I the whole time I was talking about this and we ne- I never actually thought that villains can be Mary Sue's as well. I'm just like, ah oh. well, the- <laughs> I I was going to say that ah oh, came out of nowhere. You you're acting like the girl in the one Barbie commercial that suddenly you became impressed with the product. <laughs> <laughs> We're into Barbie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, sorry. I've, I too have seen that nostalgia critic. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say that because as a man who watches a show about pastel ponies, I have to assert my masculinity and say I don't watch Barbie commercials because <laughs> that makes sense. Oh yeah, yeah, totally, totally. But, well, okay. Um, example: there was this comic never saw completion, but there was a alternate reality where Celestia got turned into a changeling and Chrysalis throughout the whole thing was pretty much invincible. Every, every contingency, contingency she had planned. Uh, and a lot of fans criticized, you're basically saying Chrysalis cannot lose anything. So I thought, yeah, a villain can become uh, a Mary Sue, Gary Stu, if they have no weaknesses, no flaw in their plans, no matter what the characters do, they still lose. It's kind of like little kids playing and they invent new powers or rules to counter one another. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But in all honesty, when you mention um, somebody having the perfect counter plan to counter the whatever it is um, villain or hero does, that would be similar to Batman. 
I'm Batman. Ah, oh, Batman. Yep, because <laughs> Batman <laughs> is one of those characters that has an answer for almost everything, for every situation. He has contingency plans for everything. Yeah, it's, um, this has been mentioned to me before that Batman is a bit of a Gary Stu because he's always prepared and I'm like, but that's part of his character because he's supposed to be the greatest detective ever. Um, but also have this tragic story behind him, blah, blah, blah. So he's like, oh, parents are dead. Oh, God. You know, the more we talk about this, darkness, uh, the, the more we talk about this, right? The more I'm realizing, oh my God, certain characters are Mary Sue, so Gary Stew, so oh God. Uh, my, my vision of Batman can never be the same. I need to watch that Lego Batman soon. Get the Lego Batman. And then, yeah, then they recently reveal, oh no, he's really just looking to die because he's that edgier. <laughs> Mm. Her, her. Uh, I'm Pat Sasuke. <laughs> well, it's it's funny because I recently watched the um, most uh, recent Warner Brothers animation, um, Return of the Caped Crusader. Yes, that's which so is awesome. An animated version um, that is based, but also parodies the 1960s um, Adam West TV series and of Batman. Batman, and it's absolutely fantastic. And Batman is voiced by Adam West. <laughs> Yes, it's just shown because um, it started off as dark and gritty, and then it, it got campy, and then it got dark and gritty again. And um, yeah, the that movie just celebrates that golden age of when Batman was kind of the perfect superhero, even though he wasn't super powered. But you know, he was the one that upheld all the laws, even um, jaywalking. Yeah. <laughs> like um oh no we can't run across the road jaywalking is a serious offense and then <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. they just walk to find a crosswalk or traffic Zebra, lights yeah. whatever pedestrian costing and then they just stroll walk slowly across the road and then they just wave at the cars and go yes we are batman and robin we are awesome we we uphold the law but we also follow it you know so <laughs> instead of being the um you know the Batman as we know him, he upholds the law, but he doesn't follow it. He's outside of it, you yeah, know, yeah. so, yeah. <laughs> Which is far more interesting to me, but eh, whatever. But that Batman <laughs> is so cool. He's the 60 Batman. Oh, God, we can have a whole lot of Batman conversation. Carry on, see we'll save yes. us. Mm. Mm. Well, basically, I if a villain can be a Mary Stu, it's not enough just to have a, a, a character who's ultimate goodness and ultimate badness butting mm. heads. It's often how they challenge one another, I think, that really, how they point out the flaws in one another's philosophy Mm -hmm. that makes them an interesting dynamic. Mm. Uh, Batman and the Joker are a great example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The unstoppable force, the immovable object, until Heath Ledger dies. Aww. And we get the guy in the Suicide Squad who's just kind of, eh? Yeah. I'm here because Harley Quinn's here. Yeah. That's basically Kill what me. that joker was. <laughs> uh, so I just want to point out that I, I think Tommy's definition and it was incomplete. Part of what really seems to cheapen things, is, as many of us have said during this podcast, is when a character is never vulnerable, never challenged. They feel like... They're always in control of the situation, even when things aren't going their way. You know, there's never that sense that things have bot- bottomed out for them. Superman always has a superpower to counter the bad guy. That would make him less identifiable. Well, but in Superman's case, people were, well, in the DC world's case, their heroes were always meant to be put up on a paragon of greatness. Unlike Marvel superhero characters, they're more so relatable. You need on like a pedestal. Yes, thank you. But, yeah, nice. but here's the thing. Sometimes even they, even the DC characters, uh, Superman versus the Elite. Yeah, I remember them. I mostly saw the animated version. Same here. Superman, he can feel people giving in to the Elite's view of harsher penalties, greater aggression. And you feel for him that he's, he's trying so hard to set an example and it's just hard to, he has to basically break those those morals to defend them and to to get people to realize and to also be thankful he doesn't subscribe to that line of thinking. That was one of the best Superman character moments in my eyes. So that's why I don't consider Superman a a Mary Sue. I think he does Mm. struggle and doubt what kind of example he sets for the world. Mm, True, Mm. but it's usually, how do I put this? 
when it comes to Superman, it's usually the situation that he's in. Superman, to be honest, he is so wide or he is so big that certain writers see him in certain lights. And with the versus the elite, he's written in a way where he has to kind of think that way. And if you take a look, see at the latest blunder, Batman vs. Superman, he is put in a light where I want to be the greatest hero. I want to do all the good because I am an American citizen, but I'm also an alien from outer space. But Batman hates me. Oh, uh, what should I do? Oh, no. <laughs> ba- this bad guy has kidnapped my mother, Marta. Oh, <laughs> what a queen kidding that... Your mother and my mother have the same name. Hmm. Although, I did feel for Superman after that bomb went off and he's just standing there in the flames. Kind of this look on his face, like, I tried to reach out and all I did was play into someone else's hands. But, okay, in all honesty, right, this is one of the things where, okay, you have this super speed, you have keen super sense. Why couldn't you just speed your way fly through the roof and explode in the air while saving everyone. Like, could it that be possible? I think if you lay enough of a guilt trip, he can be distracted. <laughs> Why else would you put the bomb in a dude's wheelchair? <laughs> I do love uh, how it should have ended. <laughs> oh, jeez. Fly, spin the world backwards. <laughs> this man has a bomb! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> but, Superman aside, we do have other characters out there which I can't think of right now but here's here's a fun one Gary and Mary Sue that failed right out of the gate they're supposed to be great but the audience don't think so right out of the gate do you have any? are we talking fandom works or or characters in the world? because I feel hesitant (laughs) about naming people uh, uh, let's go for in the fandom let's not poke fun at the fandoms because well they're starting up Let's go for people who are paid to do this. Mm. And I have one, if you don't mind me starting out first. Please. Tommy Wiseau's The Room. His oh. character. Um, what is it? Tommy? No. Um, uh, what was his character's name? I forgot. It's not Tommy, right? Let's just call him Tommy. Uh, Tommy. I, I, just... I need to know because this is <laughs> bugging me. To you, Google. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, let's see. Johnny, yes. Yeah, Johnny. Uh, the, he he starts off <laughs> to be quote unquote. Oh, I am the most likable character. Everybody enjoys me. Like I am the best. Like I am the best friend. I'm the most greatest worker. But my girlfriend cheats on me. Oh, poor was me. But <laughs> the delivery was not good. <laughs> no. <laughs> but, get out! Get out! Get out of my life! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tear me apart, Lisa. Oh, hi, Mark. <laughs> so how's your sex life? <laughs> oh my god. But still, but fail character, fail Mary and Gary still because of performance, but memorable as heck. Uh, I got, I got one from my childhood. I didn't realize it at the time, but looking back, it's like, yeah, he's pretty boring. Mm-hmm. Jace from the lead character of Jace and the Wheeled Warriors. Oh, I've not heard of that. I need to Google it. Jace in the wheel. I'm, I'm old. So old. I just had a birthday and I'm older. <laughs> I also oh. just had a birthday. I am also older. Oh, but not as old as me. Yeah, really. It's the day after his birthday. He's feeling 93. <laughs> Actually, that's more just because 2016 has been rough. But Jace of Jason the Wheeled Warriors. This guy is cardboard. He's basically a master strategist who always knows what to do, has never really made a wrong decision, has no character flaws. He's sort of that 80s paragon, like trying to be Optimus Prime, though Prime was a little bit more fallible. And here's the thing that kills me. It's called Wheeled Warriors because they all drive these futuristic vehicles to battle other vehicles. But he, Jace has a magic ring. That every episode he just recites a, 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 a incantation, a, a, basically a Dr. Seuss rhyme, and the ring fixes whatever problem. It can do anything. So it's a Deus Ex Machina then? It is pure Deus Ex. And it's like, dude, why are you relying on these four-wheeled vehicles when you just have to say the rhyme and everything's fixed right away? 
but he never does because that would kill the show. But he's so perfect, you never really sympathize with him. He's on a quest to find his father. I'm on a never-ending quest to save my girlfriend. <laughs> uh. Because he never tries to feel his way through things, uh, he always has the answer. You just think, dude, you're really boring. <laughs> But, okay, for his time, was it good? It was a classic 80s show. There were elder elements that kept me interesting. Uh, Herc, the captain of the ship they were traveling on, he's your Han Solo type. Mm -hmm. For every... For Jace's perfection, Herc's fallibility, and he claims to be doing this for the money even though he's a scoundrel with a heart of gold. Okay. Pure Han Solo. He made up for a lot. And the music, oh, the music in the battle scenes is what really sells it. <laughs> well, so the characters are dead, but the rest are pretty good, all right? Uh, yeah. And you girls have anything? Yeah, I'm good. Uh, Maddie, do you have a character in popular fiction you you view as a failed character or, you know, Mary Sue, Gary Stewish? Um, I can't think of another character at the moment other than what characters I've already mentioned. No, I'm good. <laughs> right. Well, then Same I've got either. just... I, what, I think what? I mentioned, like, friggin' Chloe Carmichael from the uh, Fairly Odd Parents, yeah, yeah. but that's a... Yeah. Well, yeah. That's uh, Mary and Gary Stu. I mean... Uh, here's our feel, Mary and Gary Sue. It's like, right out of the gate, failed. <laughs> and then I do have one final topic mm -hmm. as we, before we head into final thoughts. And mm -hmm. Maddie, this, this requires digging up a dialogue you had with Lily Pete. Ah, I, I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Wait, what? Um, in one of their videos, they used the thumbnail from my Mary Sue video. Am I right? Is that what you're talking about, Silver? Yes, indeed. Uh, yes. Lily was 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 coming down on folks for disliking Alcorn OCs right out of the right off the bat. Well, yeah, there are some good Alcorn OC. Um, I I can't think of any at the moment personally. Lightning bliss. Lightning bliss. Lightning bliss. <laughs> That's Lissy, it. I'm sorry. I'm I'm <laughs> thinking of other people. <laughs> like, yes, Lissy does have a very good backstory, but I'm talking about like um, you know, from like a fan fiction perspective, not really uh like self interpretation as an Alcorn mm. type of perspective. Like you mm. know what I'm trying to say? Yeah. Well, the reason I bring this up is that I, I found it very fascinating at the time because. In a sense, I got the I got the impression that both Maddie and Lily were arguing for the same thing. Yeah. But somehow it ended up appearing in conflict. So, so Maddie, I, forgive me if I'm speaking for you, but the impression I got is you were advising people not to rely on the fact of characters in Alicorn to make them a good character. That you um, have to you have to flesh them out. Well, a character can be. I said this earlier. A character can still be a Mary Sue or Gary Stu, regardless of their species. You know, but more often than not, especially in this fandom, it's the alicorns are usually Mary Sue characters because people automatically think, ah, my character must be perfect. They must be, they must be the fastest character. You know, they, you know, all this kind of stuff. They must be the strongest to overcome everything because they're underdeveloped. But like, like you know, a, a character that's that it doesn't matter what species they are. There is still a possibility of them being a Mary Sue, and, and it's knowing what what to look out for and make sure that you're avoiding that. And the best way is just to give the character time to develop into their personality to grow. And, and it's like you can't do that overnight. That takes time. But I, I can't remember ex the exact dialogue that myself and Lily Pete had. Well, on Lily's side, from what I remember, he was making the argument that people are too. Uh, She was making the argument that people were too uh, eager to denounce a character as a Mary Sue, Gary Stu, just because they were an alicorn. Mm. Uh, the example she used is that she'd rather read a story about uh, an alicorn spirit of death working, fighting a Balrog in the seventh layer of hell <laughs> than she would read about Joe Schmo working at the street corner shop. His argument is don't dismiss the character just because they're an alicorn. And the impression I got from your video was don't stop the character at they're just an alicorn. 
So in a sense, I think you both want, were emphasizing the need for proper character development mm-hmm. and, and proper and proper uh, relatability. And this reminds me of something that uh, James Cork likes to say when it comes to OCs or characters, is that he mentioned this, like an OC is how you develop on it. It's basically you can have a red and black Alicorn OC with two horns, seven wings... And he could have fiery eyes and he is the most powerful creature out there. But he just wants to have a normal life selling flowers at the street corner. To me, <laughs> funny as it may sound, I would like to listen to the adventures of Bob, the seven wing uh, to horn pony who wants to sell flowers because it would be an interesting read. And in my case, I'd actually like a story where uh, Joe Q. Public has to battle of Balrog in the seventh layer of hell and he's woefully under equipped <laughs> the, the funny thing is that that instantly conveys some vulnerability he's in a fight that is far beyond his means and Alicorn you see a wings and a horn you assume power mm-hmm. and so that character is less vulnerable in that fight because they are properly equipped to handle mm-hmm. it mm-hmm. that's where I think uh, I think that's why Alicorns can be a pitfall they're implied to be more powerful off the bat that's why Cadence, Flurry Hearts, and Twilight all received very harsh uh, criticism upon their arrival or ascension. And you know what? This reminds me of one of the comics, the, the micros that we really, really enjoy, which is Micro 10 featuring Luna. In this comic, if you guys don't remember, is Luna badmouth Celestia saying that her job is stupid easy. Celestia got offended saying, you know what? Why don't you take over and try for a day since you're all great and powerful? I'm just going to sit back and relax. I'm not even going to tutor you. Have fun. And she learned the hard way that Celestia's job is not easy. While Celestia has her day in the sun. <laughs> oh my got, goodness. Yeah, mm-hmm. and, and we liked Luna for her vulnerability. But here I am, Maddie. I, I've been using your video as an example and I've not allowed you much of a chance to talk. <laughs> It's it's okay. Um, if if I can talk about the the videos because um that the video that I made with Mary Sue the very first one is the most popular video on my YouTube channel and it was made like two or three years ago and I've changed styles I've you know moved on from that subject and everything but it it keeps coming back up and that that's that's okay that's fine but that video is also used quite a lot as a weapon toward people and I know that that happens because people tell me that that's happened and I'm like dude I'm so sorry that is not why that video was made if anything it was made just because I was tired of people asking me to draw alicorn OCs all the time and they were just not very interesting so I was like screw it I'm going to make a stupid little funny video about it and the next thing I know it's got like what almost 800,000 views or something ridiculous I, I and I, that yeah. being my first introduction towards you, and then I started yeah. watching your whole channel. <laughs> for a lot of people, especially in the MLP fandom, that's what they know me for, is, oh, you're basically the I hate everything of the pony fandom. Um, oh, I don't... Even though I've only made six videos with the words I why I hate in the title. <laughs> but, um, yeah, you know, why I hate the the pony generator thing, why I hate red and black OCs, which was just made as a stupid follow-up to the Mary Sue video. I don't mean to yeah. bring this up as a source of conflict. I found the video very insightful and well mm-hmm. well articulated. Thank the, you. The Mary Sue video. So it's, it's, not, it's not my intent to make this uncomfortable. No, 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 no. I'm not, I'm not uncomfortable. I'm just, I'm just saying that's what's happened. But looking back and remembering when I was making the video, I was having so much fun with it. <laughs> And it was the first time that Maddie, um, oh, yum, cynical, sorry. I'm getting distracted. (laughs) Stop distracting me with your cinnamon rolls, stuff. Right, um, I I um, have some downstairs. (laughs) (laughs) Um, what was I saying? Oh yeah, it was the first video where I, Maddie was given the opportunity to um, talk to someone else other than the person watching the video. And that was a big step in her character development as far as the YouTube avatar goes anyway, because before that she was just the mascot for, 
for me or like just you know some a character that represented me on the internet but then now she's she's much more of a character because of what Mary Sue did Mary Sue really grew because of the people that that watched the the video anyway they took Mary and um they would place her in all these different situations and think this is what Mary Sue would do if um she was in the suicide squad or this is what Mary Sue would do if she was in Star Trek and it's funny because you would have a character like Wesley Crusher who is a guy who's do in you know <laughs> I actually have a picture of Mary Sue wearing the Wesley Crusher jumper um yeah but but basically what I'm trying to say is is that as people think that having a a, a character that is a Mary Sue it, it's a bad thing which is in terms of storytelling, but you can use them in other means as well as, you know, perfect example is that video. Like, without Mary Sue, I don't think I would have as much of a following as I do. So now, because Maddie is, they're, they're like, uh, they're two sides of me. Like, Maddie is the, the frustrated artist who's very cynical but she's also like very passionate and can be very inspiring to other people whereas Mary Sue is like creativity personified she's a loose cannon she wants to do anything and everything she possibly can but needs needs Maddie to rein her in you know but at the same time Mary kind of helped Maddie out as well so and sometimes so <laughs> you're yeah. saying you're saying Mary Sue wants to oh 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 try everything <laughs> <laughs> or, or should I just let it go? Uh, but you know what? Um, with all this talk, I, I think I can summarize everything in one bundle, which is: no matter what character you create, what no matter what character you write for, A is develop it first. B make it fun, and C is have fun doing so. If you're not having mm-hmm. fun, that means you're not going to create a story that you would enjoy or everyone, anyone else would enjoy. The most important part is to have fun. Yes. Yes. And with that, I think we have gone long and everybody's hungry. We, we have. <laughs> yes. Everyone's yeah. hungry. Set, uh, Maddie is having visions of cinnamon r- buns dancing in <laughs> over her head. So <laughs> let, let's okay. go to the no. lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby and get ourselves a treat. Yay. And Safi is Safi is now tormenting uh, Maddie by eating on screen, oh, also showing off her boy band posters in the background. That's Metallica. Shut up. You you know you view them as a boy band. Not really. Anyway, uh, Norman has given some excellent closing thoughts. Safi, mm-hmm. Ma- Maddie, Sue. <laughs> Sassy Press, what is your, uh, what is your closing thoughts on the topic of Mary Sue Gary Stew? Well, don't be like my ex-boyfriend who decided to make a red and black OC earth pony with mechanical wings that is actually the, du- the son of Chrysalis, who is secretly a changeling, and you're good. Very good. Miss yeah. Maddie Munchkin, what are your thoughts? I think for anyone that's listening to this, you're probably thinking, how can I avoid making a Mary Sue character? Or how do I know if my character is a Mary Sue, you know? And yeah, it's, it's like, sometimes a character can develop on their own. Like, they will tell you what they will and will not do, which is really strange. And I don't mean that literally, but like, when, when you're, um, thinking up stories for your character. If you know your character really well and know them as a person, you'd be like, no, this, they, they would never say that or they would never do that because that's not their personality. And then once you get to that point, then you know you're on the right track. Like when you know that your character is telling you what they will and will not do. So, <laughs> mm-hmm. literally, sometimes. <laughs> Get the <laughs> don't, you, don't you just yeah. hate it when your fictional character starts hounding you for mm. things that you don't want to do? <laughs> <laughs> hmm. There's just like one of the um one of the pictures that I've drawn of Maddie and Mary is it's three o'clock in the morning. Maddie is um, working on something 
on her computer. She's got bags under her eyes, so she's really tired, but she's also very determined she's going to work on this thing. And then Mary Sue's in the background that holding a book that says how to live with an artist. And <laughs> she just whispers in Maddie's ear, it's 3am, go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> And there's lots, there's lots of other different scenarios of that as well. Um, but yeah, basically what I'm trying to say, like, yeah, characters, you'll, you'll find yourself just telling yourself this, this character won't do that. You'll start to see them as an uh, actual person instead of just, just a character you've made up. Mm-hmm. They'll become, they'll co- become to mean more to you. Like, I remember, um, I am winding up here, but it's just something else that came into my head. I remember uh, watching a documentary about the making of Disney Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, and they were um, going through um, a scene, the scene at the beginning when she's running through the forest and she falls down this hole and she's in like this chasm thing holding onto a tree root. And then they were discussing how, fall, how far the fall would be. And then somebody suggested a certain height, and then one one person said, Hang on, wouldn't the, that kind of fall kill her? So it's like when you get to that point and you start thinking of your character as a real person, then then you know, yeah, you're going somewhere right with it. Yeah, I remember that story. It was really compelling, and the room was silent. Yes, yes, because they realized they actually care about this character. Like they're they're real to them now. Mm-hmm. It's not just a pencil drawing anymore, or just a name in a story. <laughs> yeah. They become more, to, they mean more to them. Like, as annoying as Mary Sue is, it's like, she she's my character and I love her because of what she means to me, what she symbolizes as well. So, yeah. Anyway, I'll stop talking because I feel like I'm rambling. <laughs> no, you're, you're, <laughs> ma- you're, you're making very okay. compelling, compelling things because it all does come down to how real the character feels. Yeah. Both to the author yeah. and audience. Yeah. Uh, for my closing thoughts, I'm going to stick by my original definition that Mary Sue is more a term for the audience's reaction than the character. Mm-hmm. Because as we've talked about various examples, there's always an exception to the rule. There are characters who are insanely powerful or, or very well liked and they don't feel like Mary Sue's or Gary Stew's. So it's something to do with audience perception, but a lot of that perception is comes about when a character feels incomplete. You're only seeing uh, the most positive character rather than a well, well, well-rounded person. And we are all fans of My Little Pony because many of these characters have relatable flaws that they work to overcome, but they're not gone by the end of the episode. They've just learned to be a little bit better about mastering their, their, weaker aspects. And so I I guess that's my urge to people who are asking, how can I avoid being a Mary Sue, Gary Sue character? Recognize that there have to be imperfections, not just I'm vulnerable to kryptonite, <laughs> but I I get mad easily. I have a strong distrust of authority. <laughs> I, uh, I always have to get the last word in, that sort of thing. It can be a relatable topic for people to connect over. And so give some thought to... Flaws that don't make your character a bad person, it makes them a dynamic person struggling to be their best self. And I think that's the lo- very long and not very short of it. Uh-uh. So, Norman, what will we be talking about on the next MBS show? Well, uh, let's see. I-, I think this might be a bit out of, I won't say topic, because th- we're recording this on a really really strange date when this is coming out. So probably when you hear this, it's going to be around the New Year's, but um, we're going to record something for the Christmas, which is the My Little Pony 2015 annual, featuring a whole bunch of artists doing a whole bunch of Hearts Warming Eve drawings. So we'll be doing that. But when this comes out, like I said, it's a wibbly wobbly timey wimey stuff. <laughs> oh, get River Song on it. Hey, hey, I got that reference. <laughs> got that reference. Uh, good job, Captain America. <laughs> but yeah, so we'll be doing a lot of 
um, we'll be doing the Christmas annuals or the holiday specials that it is. So yeah, when you hear this, honestly, I got no idea what's going to come out next because I too got no idea what's on the schedule. <laughs> uh, and I'm doing this. Uh, City Bot's going to kill me. But anywho, yeah, this is what we're going to do. Well, there you go. Joy, I, I guess. Still, now, now, Norman, you know how you feel, how I feel when you say, oh, Silver, what are you going to do next? I don't know, you didn't tell me! <laughs> <laughs> well, did I, t- even this, this, I- this is what I know, <laughs> but explaining to the audience at home, the scheduling is going to be a bit derps. <laughs> I don't. I don't know. I'm cold and scared, and there are wolves. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's better than what uh, we have outside the dungeon. Oh dear. Dungeon? <laughs> yes. Oh god. Dungeon. It's a fun so dungeon. Yes. It's yes. A fun. Dungeon with it. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Anywho, folks, we. We thank you for sticking with us through this discussion and this look over the idea of a Mary Sue. Mm. And thanks to Mad Munchkin for joining us for this conversation. Thank you for inviting me. Hey, please come again. Yes. And so, for the MBS show, I am Cecil Quill. And I am the fabulous Norman Sanzo. Huh. I have been an oversized birdwing pegasus thing that can control crystals with her mind. Oh, Sassy Frass. <laughs> and I am always mad, Munchkin. And we're saying adios. See ya. Bye bye. Oh sure, they all got to say bye, but I don't. Okay, I see how things. I think. I see. I thought this whole thing was gonna be about. Me. I didn't get an intro. So so silver. I have to ask. How are you? Are you a Gary Stu since you're a hippogriff? No, that just means I'm a sin against nature. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> uh, poor Hashtag Mary. Cinnamon. Uh, Mary City didn't get her say. Oh. If I were Celestia's illegitimate son, ostracized <laughs> by both parties, living in isolation, but battling the forces of evil because I love Equestria that much, even though everyone hates me, then I think people would start to view it as a, as a Mary Sue here. <laughs> <laughs>